Big J, you've been called the king of the honkers, or the first true rock and roller. Do you accept those titles? Well, you know, there's other guys that were blowing, but uh, I think I was the first one to really create a one-note screaming, howling, and frantic-like saxophone player that um, people begin to recognize him and call me the honker and the screamer. Did you discover that yourself? Were you, were you um, listening to other people in, in jazz playing a little bit like that, or did you pick it up and just start start honking and screaming? <laughs> well, uh, I used to go down and catch uh, Lionel Hampton with Illinois Jacket and all that cops, uh, uh, and how they used to just ride the run one note, but they weren't as wild and frantic as I, I was. Uh, uh, but they was real great players. They're great players, you know, very soulful players. And so I just taken that kind of style and just added on to it. Some people say that uh, Illinois Jacket made the first rock and roll solo in about 1944 on a song called Just Blues, I think it was called. But do you think that's about when you would date that kind of sound from, about just after the war or during the war? Yes, uh, Lionel Hampton, you know, like I said, I used to go downtown when I was very young. I was about six years old. I used to go downtown here. Uh, Illinois Jacket, was Flying Home was the number that they, yeah, they would play. And then after he'd play the first course, he'd write, bah, 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 you know, he'd write in the band with Anson. So that's about the first uh, time. But he wasn't, you know, clang, clang, you know, that squalling, screaming like I was doing. <laughs> I developed later on. What about people like Lester Young and um, and uh, Herschel Evans? Were they an influence on you? Oh, yeah, all the guys, uh, Lester Young, Don Byers, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins. And Charlie Parker was my really man because uh, I started off playing jazz with uh, Sonny Chris, Hampton Halls. We had a band together, very uh, influential, great saxophone. Uh, uh, Sonny Chris was in the piano. And Charlie Parker was a jam. Miles Davis and he came to Los Angeles and Teddy Edwards, Howard McGee. They you know, all used to jam together then. I was very young. They was older, you know. But they taught us a lot of things, and I loved them. But when I got out of school, I studied very extensively. Um, legit, I had air training, so fed, and learned how to breathe properly. It was a whole different school for a whole year. And so I kind of got out of everything, all the jazz and everything, and just really studying. And after about a year of studying, um, a guy, I never forget a guy named Prince Town said, you want to record? And I said, yeah. So I went by this little old record shop, and the guy had a record uh, by Glenn Miller where the drum started off with the sock symbol like I do on Deacon's top. And so I went home and I wrote this tune and and I recorded it. But then that's the, that's the Deacon's Hop, the first yeah. the first hit you had in 1949. Huh? Yeah, Deacon's Hop. And I just forgot about jazz, soul, everything, and just played played some soul. You know, just forgot about all the classical training that I had received. Did and you ever go back and play jazz again, or have you always? concentrated in your own style now? Well, it was very difficult to go back to play jazz because at that time they would only record exactly what you were able, you know, what the first hit record. And I was from a very poor family, so I, I needed some money, so I, I went very commercial, you know. You were born in, what, 1927 in Los Angeles, is yes, that? 1927 in Los Angeles, in a little town called Watts. Uh, some some good players come out of Watts, like Charles Mingus on bass, he came out of Watts, Buddy Collette, saxophone, and Bit, uh, Bit Whitman, so we had some nice musicians come out of Watts, California. Well, it's exactly 50 years since Wild Bill Moore recorded We're Gonna Rock, We're Gonna Roll, and that was recorded on the 18th of December 1947, so that makes it pretty close to exactly 50 years. What do you think was the first true rock and roll record? Was it that one by Wild Bill Moore, or was it Wyoming Harris's Good Rocking Tonight, which was recorded also in December 47, or do you think they were really rhythm and blues and not real rock and roll? Oh, it would be more rhythm and blues because uh, rock and roll didn't come in until... Uh, see, the, the, the white kids, was they started accepting you know, like the, this type of music, and uh, they couldn't stop the kids from coming to the concerts, and because... In fact, they stopped me from playing in Los Angeles. They barred me out. I, I, I couldn't even play. We used to play like four and 5,000 kids every week, and they were screaming and hollering. And so what they did, they'd take and put a guitar on it and a voice, and they came along with Elvis and blue suede shoes called Perkins, and then they called it rock and roll. That's when they went to rock and roll. They probably would have never went to rock and roll 
if the fact that they were very racist in America towards this type of music because the the white market was kids was accepting it a great part of it and they couldn't stop it so then they said well we just call it rock and roll and now then they went it's rock and roll then they put a guitar and then they changed it a little flavor, same beat, you know, but when you put a guitar on it and put a voice on it and put it like piano playing triplets, then you start going, because even like Fast Domino and all that, Chuck Berry, that's why that's really Chuck Berry was so big in that market, because it was more like on a rock and roll type of style. And he had a bit of country, uh, country and western influence in his songs, I think, Chunk Berry, but not, not so much Fence Domino. He was more New Orleans style. I yeah, well, New Orleans style. You know, you got the triplets, you know, and uh, with the New Orleans, because New Orleans had a great style uh, uh, of music. Uh, you know, it was really great. I love him. Uh, New Orleans style. It's great. Do you have any, any respect for what Bill Haley and Elvis Presley actually did, and did they bring a new excitement to the music, or do you think they debased it in some way? Oh, no, I, I think it brought some new excitement to the music. I just think that the people who were producing it was very unfair uh, about uh, doing it because, see, they controlled the market, and they wouldn't play. Like some of the, like Dick Crockett, if they put a black artist on it, in fact, one time, they want to cut him off the air, you know? So they, they were very racist in, in America towards the... Our music, but then now it's different now. But I mean, at that time, you know, it was quite a few years ago. Well, now I think I'd sooner come and see you than go and listen to Elvis, even if he was here. But <laughs> did you ever get to work with um, people like Elvis, or you worked with uh, Little Richard and people of that sort? But uh, well, I, I never worked with Elvis. Uh, I worked with Carl Perkins, and um, I worked with Little Richard for about thirty-one nighters on the road in America. They used to take the top ten acts of the country. They had Little Richard, Bill Doggett. Uh, Joe Turner, Five Keys to Moon Glows, Eddie James, Shake a Hand, Shake a Hand, Fair Adam, and uh, Robbins. We was all on the same bill together. We played for 31 nights through the South. And your song, Big Fat Mama, that wasn't written for any of those uh, <laughs> wonderful big mamas you sang with. Huh? Uh, no, I know. In fact, I wrote this tune in Australia. Uh, one night we was doing, um, you know, I used to come to Australia all the time, and uh, I was working with the Mighty Reapers then, and we had uh, Dave Burr on the guitar, and he was playing some low, funky, real old, like Jimmy Reed, or no down home blues type of. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I just, I said, I got a big fan of Mama, she weighed 500 pounds. And I just wrote it on TV, you know, and, and we did the TV show that night. And so the next night we was playing a gig here, and no, I'm saying that we was playing a gig in Australia, and a lady came, she said, I, st I waited all night for a big fat mama. You didn't play it, you know. Yeah. But I just wrote it that night, so now I put it in my repertoire. It's a very good tune for me. Do the ladies get upset by it? You know, some of them think it may, you know, <laughs> may, it's not very correct, politically not correct, but uh, uh, they seem to love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I think the way I introduce it, you know, and, and the way I approach it, uh, I don't think they get offended by it. You know. Even when you say, shake the jelly on the bone, man. Yeah, yeah <laughs> shake that jelly roll, but keep you warm all night long, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a great, great, good time song that really loved it. Both times I heard it in the shows you did. Great, great shows in Sydney. I mean, if you missed it, folks, you really missed something incredible. This guy is roughly 70 years old, but he can shake it better than Mick Jagger and better than anybody at 20 I've seen recently. But you... Really, Big J, you have a, a wild stage act, and I guess you were the first to develop such a wild stage act and a light show. You had strobes, apparently, in the old days, fluorescent lights, even a phosphorescent saxophone and gloves that glow in the dark. It's a really incredible <laughs> sight to see. Is that your own invention, or did you copy that from anybody? What happened, I... Uh you know, laying on the floor was a big thing. <laughs> a lot of the, the people didn't like it, especially the blacks didn't like it in America because I would lay on the floor. But they were the one that caused me to lay on the floor. I, I never forget, I was in Clarkville, Tennessee, had a great pan, a great pan. We were blowing, and the people just didn't respond. They didn't move. They said, like, well, all right, what are you going to do next? And so after the intermission, I didn't change clothes. I was trying to figure out, you know, I mean, what can I do? So I went back, and I, I got on my knees. Nothing happened. So I said, well, nothing else to do but lay on the floor. So I laid on the floor, man, and that really broke that spell. The people started really grooving. And I said, hey, well, let me try this again. I tried it in Texas, and it went over great. So then I got to back home in Los Angeles, and I tried it, man. That's when all the Spanish and the white kids began going crazy about it. That's when I was in little Ebony point quick all the big 1952 best events of 1952 and so a lot of the different saxophone players begin to copy my act and so I was trying to figure out what could I do that would be different so I happened to be in a nightclub called the nightcap after hours and this girl came out dancing 
and she was in, and she went into fluorescent. I said, this is it. So I went downtown <laughs> to my music store. I said, hey, man, I want you to paint my horn. And at that time, I had it you had, it you had the horn painted with fluorescent yeah, paint, yeah? paint. Yeah, but it was transparent, mm -hmm. you know. And then I had the, the black light, but the whole horn was painted. And uh, the guys couldn't figure out what I was doing because when you look at the saxophone, it, 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 you, know, just, you, know, you couldn't tell it. But then we got ready to do this movie for BBC, uh, that I mean, yeah, BBC of London, where they had Charles Brown in it, and they had uh, Joe Liggins in it, and Martin. the Honey Dripper, yeah, yeah. And so, when they shot the picture, it wasn't vivid enough. So then I find I finally came up with the idea with this very vivid color. And so, then I painted the horn just for the TV show. And then after a while, I was carrying two saxophones. I got tired, of it. so then I decided just to paint the outside, you know, the strip of the horn to where you could see the horn, but not the whole body of the horn. And then I developed, I put on the white gloves, and then I, you just see the gloves and the saxophone glowing. So that's how I come up with that idea. It's tremendously effective and really, really exciting visually, too. Um, and the lying on the floor, I suppose in Bill Haley's band and, and people like Little Richard, they would put their feet on the piano and some of them would climb over the double bass. I mean, people in the rock and roll were doing Jerry Lee Lewis would climb on the piano, but I think your show is even more exciting than those. Right? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, I was the one that really started to, to lay on the floor. Even Jim, Jimmy Hendrix, he used to come up and see me in Seattle with his father, and he's the one that got the idea of walking through the audience and screaming. And, really? Yeah. I guess Bo Diddley and T-Bone Walker and others were doing some pretty uh, exciting things too. Yeah, yeah T-Bone Walker used to do the splits, and, and, and Bo Diddley did a lot of things. I worked with Bo Diddley once up in uh, Arizona. So, yeah, all the guys begin to uh, get acts and things, you know. So what I try to do, I try to get audience participation and work with the people and try to entertain the people, whatever it takes. And you walk around the audience, you play... Um, you play as you as you walk. You've got that great portable microphone tied to the tied to the horn. You lie down on the floor, as you say. You sing. You play. You sit at the tables with the audience. You get the girls really excited. <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret at seventeen? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, <coughs> well, the thing is that I still want to want to entertain the people. That's my whole uh, program is to because the people pay the money to come there to be entertained and this is what I try to do. So that's what I try to do. I do a lot of variety of things now that I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm 70 that I, at that time, I, I started singing now that I didn't do. I started singing about maybe seven years ago. Uh, before that, when I had all the big hits and things, I wasn't even singing like, there's something on your mind. I, I uh, had little Sonny recorded with me, you know, and uh, that's a great song. I really love the way you sing that. It's uh, really like a very early um, soul song, isn't it? It was before all of the all of the big soul singers. That was a hit in what 50 59, 59, 59 yeah, 59. big hit. Everybody's recorded after that. Yeah. But I, I can't believe that you weren't singing yourself because you've got such a great voice. Um, what did you do in the uh, 60s and the 70s? Was that uh, a period when you were doing other things or you were still playing? Well, at, in, in the 60s, I realized that uh, my spiritual food need to be, <laughs> um, was v being affected, you know, spiritually. So I said, hey, it's about time to me uh, to get back to the meetings and get myself spiritually together, you know, again, you know, because I was baptized as a Jehovah Witness in, uh, when I was 12. I know one in my family I accepted the truth, but myself, but then, you know, playing music like the prodigal son, you kind of go out, drift away, you know, but you still realize that uh, there's a God and that you, you're spiritual, as Jesus said, the one who's conscious of the spiritual needs. And I realized that, hey, it's time to stop all of this and uh, settle down and get myself together. So in 60, I quit. Do you think um, some people think that the blues is the kind of the, the devil's music and uh, a little bit exaggerated, I think, but do, do you think there's a, a difference... Uh, like Little Richard, when he was in Sydney in the 50s, he threw his rings into the into the sea and said, I'm going back to God. Was that something like that that happened to you? Well, no. You see, you know, when when you get the truth, the truth helps you realize what is the truth. You know, you, we, the, the, there's so many people th say so many things that are not in the Bible, so many things are not true uh, that they say music is music, you know, and uh, it's not the devil's music, you know. I mean, why is it the devil's music? devil didn't create you, God created you, <laughs> you see? And, but a lot of people try to associate that with that, you know. But that's their belief. But when you study the Bible and you get to accurate knowledge, you, you realize music is music, you know. But there have been um, blues singers who 
been torn between the blues and gospel music and have shifted between the two? Well, gospel music, you know, it's, uh, you know when they say gospel, uh, they mean that they sing tunes that are say, created by uh, religion, like the, the, the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, the different churches, you know, like you go into a lot of the churches, uh, other churches, they're supposed to be religious, they don't have that soulful type of, of music, it's the individual, because they can sing the tune, you go into maybe, I don't know what it's called, other faith, but you go into one church, and it'd be very straight, you know, and then they take that same tune and give it to some black artists or something, and they sing it their way, then it's all together a different, different thing, it all depends on the individual. Yeah, when I go to church in England, you know, at the, uh, the Anglican church, I sometimes wish we had the Holy Rollers there, <laughs> rocking it up a bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I got so, yeah. But um, talking of Little Richard, you, um, did you have a, an influence, you think, on his saxman? I, was, I used to imagine this universal saxman who suddenly would appear on all these records, you know, whether it's Fats Domino or Little Richard. But quite often it was this guy, Lee Allen. And Dwayne Eddy, you know, even a, a guitarist like Dwayne Eddy had a great sax man called Steve Douglas. But they all sound like you. Did they get the uh, Did they get the sound from you? I don't really know whether they got the sound from me or not. I, I know I didn't hear them until after you know I I came out blowing wild in '49 and. I, I, then I guess, you know, down, down south in New Orleans, they had a New Orleans sound on sax, and a lot of guys, uh, once they hear what's happening on the records, then they begin to copy that style, whether promote, whether record player them, hey, I want you to blow like this on this record, you know. And so guys begin to copy different styles, whatever's selling at that time, and like Cornbread with like uh, this other guy, uh, Hal yeah, Hal Singer, you know, now he's really a jazz saxophone, I mean, he won't play. Yeah, I think it was, uh, he's with Basie, and the guy gave him $50. I said, hey, come on, man, do cornbread. Big hit. But yet he wasn't fouled up because he wanted to play jazz. Because we were supposed to do a big battle saxophone, and he refused because he don't want to play. He was scared, was he? He didn't want to uh, be beaten by you. I don't know if he was scared, but I mean, uh, he just, uh, he wouldn't do it. I mean, he just, he wants to play jazz. I think he lives in Paris now. He wants to play jazz, so that's it. At that time, you get the jazz enthusiasm. They really thought they want to play is jazz. They, but he wanted to make some money right quick, so he just went over and did this thing. Not that he couldn't do it, but... Uh, he had to play jazz. So do you think you were one of the great survivors of rock and roll from the beginning of rhythm and blues? Yes, I am. Uh, I think I'm about the only one living today now <laughs> that really uh, still blowing because uh, and uh, starting next year, I'm going to start teaching um, in America. I have a grant and uh, teach uh, ones how to play uh, rock and roll. Uh, I mean, not rock and roll, but the rhythm and blues, the honking and screaming. Uh, because Can I sign up and join the class? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's more to it than just uh, playing one note. It's Because um, like when I study, I learn how to play four vibrators at 100. And it's, that makes it give you a big, fat, fat, big sound. But it's the air pressure uh, that you play that gives you all the overtones. And it's the way that you repeat notes. Uh, sometimes play fast vibrators, slow vibrators, and the way that, and like certain notes, affects people different ways. And you learn that over the years. Like you play low notes, or high notes, or, or ride one note a long time. You may write one for uh, maybe 32, but if you're playing the blues, you may do it for three or four courses just to one note because that repetition keeps you motivating people, yes. Yeah. What, is, what about your, I mean, what were your wildest shows? Can you remember where you really had them absolutely uh, jumping out of their seats on? <laughs> oh, we, we did so many shows. It was incredible. Like, uh, well, I, I did a thing with Johnny Ray. Uh, we had out Drew Ray Anthony and K-Star in San Diego. And, and so the Capitol Records, they all came down to find out what was going on. They had all these big acts down there. And, and we just, all the people down downtown with us. And so uh, the manager, but Johnny Ray's manager, he just came out with Christ. Big J break the show up, man. And they didn't know, so I broke the show up, man. The police come, say, stop him, or we're going to stop the show. One kid jumped out of the balcony, you know. So You really, you really had to have the police to come and <laughs> cool it down, huh? Oh, yeah. And so I was supposed to travel with him, but they said, no, they wouldn't let me travel. Nat King Cole wouldn't let me play with him on the big shows, because I was with GAC then. And they was the one that was able to put me back east and work. I was working at the Apollo Theater, you know. Celebrity Club, Birdland in New York. In fact, on the Nervous Man CDs, I have a lot of, uh, quite a few tunes that I did live in Birdland. That was a big spot. I played there with Dizzy, uh, played there with Miles Davis, Ben Webster, and all the guys. Yeah. Because um, 
even Charlie Parker could do some really good blues. I got a great, a great funky blues um, track, which is really wild. It's got that sort of oh strong yeah. sax sound. You know? Oh yeah, Charlie Parker. I, I think he was the greatest of all of all the saxophonists, man. I mean, a lot of soul, and like he just didn't play notes. You could hear all the changes and stuff. A lot of guys just be running over their horns, you know. But you could hear all the changes, the melody just flowing right through. He, he was the greatest of all I know, and so forth. Do you think? Um, Drugs affected his playing, or did it? Um, or alcohol? I mean, what what were the, uh, the the downsides of playing as well as that? Oh yeah, well we know that drugs is <laughs> thing that really destroyed the man. You know, um, it was sad too because a lot of guys thought they had to be high to play. You know, and it was so sad. Uh, drugs have destroyed so many musicians. The fact that you're 70 and still blowing so so fit and healthy suggests that you've been living a pretty good life. Oh yeah, like I say, when you have your spiritual life, uh, when, when, when everything else fails, you know God's not going to fail. And so th it, it carries you through a lot of problems that brought the blacks through the slavery, you know, uh, uh, trusting God that, you know, would help them some kind of way to set them free. And that was how they were able to endure, or, you know, then after it was set free, all the racism and all the stuff that we still had to go through uh, to try to make it, you know, so it's been very tough, but with the spiritual, it helps you, and I think that would help me through with music, because I was barred out of all the places in Los Angeles, uh, uh, that's when, they, like I said, they brought the Elvis and the Blue Suede Shoes and Carl Perkins, and they brought them in, and they changed it to to what they call rock and roll. And then those who had control of the record company, control of the radio, they began to play that stuff. And so the kids can only buy what they hear. Like right now, all my records now are on my own label. In America, they say, well, we can't market this. So that's when you don't hear it. Big J, have a very happy Christmas. Oh, thank you very much. It's really great talking to you. And, uh, I want to say, listen to this crazy cat because he's the greatest cat in the world. Mr. Potts with the radio show. That's right, brother. Thank you. Cheers.